All right, we're going to go ahead. We'll do an opening prayer and a pledge, and then we'll get started. Stand, please. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the county you gave us, the state you gave us, the country you gave us, and pray that you'll be with all the candidates, be with us here tonight, and that this will be a productive forum. Pass this in your name. Amen. Amen. Are you saying the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. I appreciate everybody coming tonight. This is the third and final forum of the State County Conservatives. Tonight we have county commissioners. We may have one school board member uh, show up a little later. Uh, the way this is going to work, we're going to give everybody a chance to do a little quick intro. We've got six or seven questions. They're going to answer the questions. They are on a time limit. Uh, Ten seconds out from them hitting their time limit. Jeff, our timekeeper, will just hit the bell once. That way they know they got ten, se ten seconds to finish up. And at the end, they'll get a minute closing, and then we'll take some uh, questions from the audience after that. Make sure you keep the questions relative to policy. No, no Facebook stuff, no personal stuff, just relative to policy. And everything will be good to go. Right, we've got another minute or two here, and we'll get started. Oh, one, one correction here. Okay, Jan will do an intro. And Jan will do a closing. He'll take questions after. But Jan's not going to answer the questions from the forum because Jan had a hand in developing the questions. So, so everybody knows. All right, I got 6.30. We're going to go ahead and start with the intros. We'll start right here. To the podium, do your intro. Pay attention to the timekeeper. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jan. I thought it was still on the back. There we go. Okay. Okay. My name is Jan Black. I'm the current district seven commissioner. I've been in commissioner district seven for the last seven and a half years, and I'm seeking another term. Provided y'all vote for me. Uh, the uh, reason I'm running for commissioner is that I have a, a long, long background in federal government and rules and regulations, and I can contribute to the development of rules and regulations and statutory development within the county. And I appreciate your time. Thank you.
there ain't gonna go nowhere, win or lose. Um, All right, I'm Sydney Scarborough running for District 6, and I don't think there's much that I can say that's not going to be repeated in questions one and two, so I don't want to go too far into it. But I'm happy to be here tonight, and I'm excited for any questions that you'll throw at me. So. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chris Ralston. I'm uh, 32 years old. I'm a family of four. I'm a nine-year veteran of the United States Army, where I was a UH-60 Black Hawk mechanic, crew chief, and standardization instructor. Um, my time in service brought me here to Fort Campbell, where I fell in love with my wife shortly thereafter, this community. And so it was a simple choice for us to decide to come back to Indian Mountain, where she's a lifelong resident of. and. Uh, make that our permanent residence. Um, after my completion of service, I used my GI Bill to get a degree in political science, and I intend to pursue a law degree in the future. Um, but uh, as of right now, that's about all I got for you. Thank you, Todd. Chris, Chris, go ahead and stay up here. We'll give you the first question. All right, first question. Why do you want to be a county commissioner? You have two minutes. All right, thank you, Mr. Banks. So the reason why I want to be a county commissioner, this boils down to two things, personal and professional. Professionally, like I just stated, I just finished up my degree in political science. That's within my wheelhouse. That's what my education is in, in governmental operations and the study of politics. That's exactly what I, I'm here to do. Uh, personally, the bottom line is my mother-in-law has been fighting to get a well dug for over a year now, and I'm having a trailer over 500 gallons of water up her driveway every two weeks. It's 21st century, ladies and gentlemen. There's no reason why a single citizen in our county should have to fight for over a year to get water to their house. That's it. All right, to put it simply, I believe in being the change I want to see. Change starts at home in our own backyards. I grew up in this community. My career started in this community. And I'm sorry, I plan on being in this county until the day I die. I am a longtime resident of this county. It wouldn't make sense if someone with my knowledge, drive, and love of Stewart County didn't do their duty and become a civil servant to uplift our people. I want to encourage our community to come together, work together, and build an environment where all our kids and grandkids are comfortable asking questions, getting involved, and uplifting one another in order to maintain a strong and sustainable county which I would like to be fortunate enough to help produce through various avenues that will be discussed during other questions of this forum. Why do I want to be a commissioner? Like I stated, I'm, I'm 40 years old. Um, we have a lot of fine commissioners already. I take nothing from either one of them that are already previous commissioners and the other ones that are already commissioners. But like I stated, I am 40. We, I am the next generation. If people our age don't start stepping up and start wanting to be involved in our county, where are we going to be at in 20 years? No one knows. So you know, I'm, I'm a member <coughs> on the Stewart County Industrial Board, and I'm also on Parks and Rec, so I'm already trying to do my part and help out with the county. You know, I'm trying to bring things, try to do things to fall apart, try to upgrade it for our kids, for generations to come. I feel that it's, you know, like I said, me and Drew, we had a conversation before I even decided to run. And, you know, I respect him. I respect Mr. Randall, which both, you know, commissioners in District 2, I respect him a lot. And, um, Win or lose, if I if I did lose one of those two, you still were led by two great men. But if I don't try, and this next generation don't try, we have a dying breed up here on our board. And that's my biggest reason for trying to run. Why I want to be a commissioner, I'll start with why I initially wanted to be a commissioner four years ago. Uh, I worked for the County Highway Department, and <clears throat> excuse me. I, I would come to meetings 
couple times a year just to see what kind of roof it's going to be, to be honest with you. But one thing I did notice at the county commission at that time was at least half of the commissioners were in some way connected to the school system. Trust me, I've got nothing against the school system, but I just didn't believe any one group should have that much say on the commission. And four years ago, when it was coming time to run for the commission again, I heard a couple of teachers who were thinking about running, so I went to Philip Castile, who was the current commissioner at that time, asked him, was he gonna run? He said, no, I said, well, I'm gonna run. So that's why I initially ran. Uh, now that I've been a commissioner four years, why I want to keep doing it. I, I enjoy it. Um, there's some hard parts. I'm on the Budget and Finance Committee, and this year was the hardest year we've had out of the four years I've been on there. Uh, we had to make a lot of cuts that none of us wanted to make, but we had to do it. Uh, but we did come to a conclusion. We did pass a budget, and it was as fair as we could be with everyone. But that's, I, I enjoy that. I, I enjoy the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, I enjoy the, uh, I'm on several committees, the Animal Control, uh, several of them, I can't think of them right now, but I, I do enjoy most of the job now. I, I do, do not like when people get upset with me about, you know, something that we do or I do. You know, that's that's the bad part of the job that we do. But that's why I would like to do the commission. Go ahead and stay up. I'll give you the next question. Mr. Vance, are we to, I just want to make sure we're clear. Are we to understand you to say that Mr. Black will not be taking any questions? He'll take questions at the end. Why won't he answer these questions? Because he wrote them? Is he that what you're saying? So the question, all is, all is, the question is... He didn't is, write all of them. Well, the question is why I want to be a commissioner. You're telling me he can't answer that question? Look, if we had allowed him to answer questions, then all I would hear on Facebook is, well, Jan wrote the questions, and then he answered the questions. Well, so if you have man, questions... This is not about Facebook. So this after is about this is over... Why he wants to be a commissioner. If anybody wants to ask him these questions, you can ask him these questions after this party's over. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, I, it's, you're not running this, right? But still, it doesn't seem fair that he has... Go ahead and make your post later. <clears throat> Second question, number two. Why do you think you will be a good commissioner? Well, uh, like I said, I have been a commissioner for four years. Uh, lots of phone calls and just a couple of complaints. Uh, I know Becky's not happy with me, but uh, no, we will keep it. Uh, why am I a good commissioner? I, I attend every meeting. Now, last year, I took a job, I went over the road, and I when I initially ran, I was trying to attend the meetings virtually or over the phone, however you do that. But that, that got squashed, we couldn't do that. But since I've been back, I've been to every single meeting, committee meeting, commission meeting we have. So uh, I'm open, you know, I could be called or text or whatever. So uh, that's why I want to be Christian. Why do I think I bet a good commissioner? Well, everybody tries to think that you'll be the best at everything they do automatically. If not, why is it worth trying? I'll give 100%. I will listen to everybody in my district. I want to be a voice for ones that feel they're not heard. Ones that feel they can't talk to a certain, to a certain commissioner. I put my pants on the same way every one of y'all do every day. We all, we were all born, we are all raised, we go to work, one day we die. It don't matter who you are, what you got, we're all promised that. I don't want anybody to feel scared, ashamed, or feel they will be made fun of or laughed at. I swear to anybody, I will never make you feel that way. I'm not gonna know every answer. I'm not going to know as much as these gentlemen do when you start out. I'm never going to claim to. But I do promise you this. I will try my hardest to find the answer or a solution to every question or every comment you have. Seven days a week, I will post my number. You can call me. I'm right on the highway. I'm easy to find. And I promise you, I'll give every single one of you 100% of myself.
I'll be a good commissioner because I listen. I make myself available to people and I genuinely care when people are unhappy. I have a background in business management and it has trained me to be good at listening, communicating, constantly reassessing where I stand, budgeting, planning, and ultimately managing various situations based on the good of people as a whole. I have a passion for Stewart County. It's not about notoriety, money, or control for me. It's about helping people with the skills I've acquired and ensuring that what we as a community leave behind for the next generations is better than how we receive it. I work for this community in several ways. I work for the Chamber of Commerce to promote tourism and encourage people to support local business in order to give back to our community members and increase existing county revenue streams. I work for the school system as a substitute teacher to uplift and support our school system and our children. I work for a friend and a local business owner so that he has help when needed. I also volunteer for more projects than I can count, including recording and uploading county meetings in order to promote education and transparency for local government. This means that I attend all county meetings and I stay very aware of county proceedings. I dedicate everything I possibly can to this county as a citizen. I am not afraid to ask questions. I'm not afraid to admit when I'm wrong and I consider it an honor to be your next commissioner for District 6. <laughs> Mr. Francis, can you just clarify which question we're on the why I would be a good commissioner? Why do you think you would make a good, you will be a good commissioner? All right, thank you. Two minutes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I believe that I'll make a good commissioner just simply because of my passion and how much I care about this community. Uh, just like Mr. Booth said, I wouldn't be as bold to say that I'll be better than any one commissioner that we have standing or any one that you will elect. Uh, but I will promise, just as Mr. Booth did, that I'm going to work for you. And let me tell you, the partisanship within the county is getting out of hand. Okay, As a county commissioner, no matter what party I belong to or don't belong to, when I get elected, I'm going to be an impartial commissioner for every member of our community. When you come through that door to talk to us or bring an issue, I don't look at you as any particular public or uh, political entity, right? I look at you as a citizen of this county. I'm going to hear what you have to say. I'm going to bring arguments to the table for you. If there are arguments brought against, I'm going to fight that. I'm going to refute arguments. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to say I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, and that's really all I've got, ladies and gentlemen. For what I lack in experience as a commissioner, I'm going to bring energy, I'm going to bring researching and resourcing capabilities, and just the motivation to continue on with the mission and drive forward. Thank you Okay, number three, we'll start with Mr. Shepard. I'll read it out to you. Are you willing to hold all public officials accountable for fraud, waste, and abuse, or other violations of the law? You have two minutes. Okay. Wish I had more time to prepare for this. Um, yeah, I think everyone needs to be held accountable for any mistakes or violations that they do. Um, I think we need to be careful. There's rumors and there's facts. We don't need to listen to rumors and try to start bring up an issue. We need to know the facts before we start an investigation. Uh, if the county mayor or this person or this person, anybody violates some type of law, they should be punished. <laughs> county commissioner violates law, he should be punished, okay? Everyone should be a hand to kill a camel for their actions, but I, I just think we need to be careful with stuff like this. We need to listen to facts and not just rumors. Thank you. As Mr. Shepard said, you have to go by facts. You can't go by what Facebook says. Not all the time. I mean, all it takes is one person to type out something that don't make it true. Yeah, I don't fix I say now it's something to look into. If you if you get a room something like that, I mean it's something it's worth looking into. If the person does, has done something, I mean, you don't know if they, they might not have known that they were doing something wrong, but they can be questioned on it and say, hey, 
Is this what you did? Do you knowingly know what you did? You know, that's a, that's a loaded question. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different factors that come in there. But yes, I, 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 if you do blatantly do something and you know you've done something wrong, yes, you should be accountable. You should be grown up and stand up, you know, take blame for what you did. I mean, yes, in different situations, depending on what it is, so that's a loaded question. I mean, if it, like I said, if it's, if it's bluntly the either they spent something or wasted something for the county's money, mayor, commissioner, no matter where you stand at, sheriff, anything, I would, if, if someone has done something, yes, I would hold them accountable and I would do my best to make it right. The short answer is yes. I believe in doing my own research, asking questions, and giving people the benefit of the doubt, but ultimately, I don't believe in promoting an atmosphere where people become complacent and aren't working to give our taxpayers a return on their investment, which is how I believe taxes should be viewed, as an investment. And laws are in place to ensure that our taxpayers are protected from bad investments. So I do firmly believe in accountability and elected officials doing the job that the taxpayers are paying them for which includes research, coordination with the county lawyer so that people can see legal returns on their investments. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as I stated earlier, I have full intention of pursuing a degree in law, uh, so I am of a legal mind, so I look at things from a legal perspective. Absolutely 100%. You broken the law? You should be held accountable to the letter of the law. That being said, if you were to bring a complaint and expect someone to do something about it, that complaint needs to be brought through proper channels and needs to be brought to the proper entities with the legal authority to make the decisions, to make judgments. If it is not, then it is, it's all hearsay and has no standing at that venue, whatever it's brought up. So absolutely, if I am elected as a commissioner, and it is brought to me in the appropriate legal manner and it is and uh, brought to the attention of the commission, I will follow through to the letter of the law. Uh, Mr. Booth, the next question is going to go to you first. You have three minutes, and yes, I know ahead of time, it's not enough time, but what do you think are the most pressing issues in the county that need to be dealt with? Oh my. <laughs> we can stay here all night long on that. Because. That's why I gave you a time. All right. Well, there's issues all across the county. Don't matter what district you're going to. Me, I'm running for district two. So, I would fight for any district. And I would help out any district I possibly can. You know, just like he stated, district one. There's no need for him to be carrying water up the driveway. Twice, you know, what you say, once, twice a week? Every two weeks. No need in. It's 2022. Why can't we get water? I understand that's a lot of his district. You know, that's something that the full commission works on. It ain't just whoever's district one. That's the full commission. That's something we should all work in. District two. Like I said, I'm already on the district board. You know, and I'm not going to take anything away from Piggly Wiggly or River Deals. Great people. I shop there. But how many people come out of District 1 and turn right to go to Clarks and spend money to go grocery shopping? A bunch. A whole bunch. I mean, we got a dollar store. They supply what they can. You always notice it's full. I feel that we could put a grocery store over there. It's not going to hurt them. The Beatles, they're still going to supply Dover, Featherwood, Paris Springs, some Paris Landing. Someone's not going to pull out a red top down there and, and drive 20, 20, 25, 30 minutes to Piggly Wiggly when they're 10 minutes from Kroger. It's not going to happen. Just like, you know, he was talking, you know, he's on the um, board for finance. It was a deficit. We had another business on that side of town. You know, you, you ain't gonna find, if anyone was elected, we're not gonna vote to raise taxes. 
You ain't gonna find any of us who wanna do that. But the money's gotta come from somewhere. We can't just poof, make it happen. We gotta bring something to this town. We need to have something here for our citizens that's gonna keep money here, bring tax money, for tax money to our area where we don't have that deficit like it is. You know, that's one of my biggest things right there in District 2 is I would love to see something come where we can save some more money back to the county. Just like District 5, go past to take the Wiggly, there's nothing until you get to Paris Lane. There's a lot of dead space right there. There's a lot of property for sale right there, and a lot of it's uh, West Vegas. It's all for sale. Something could be there. But it all boils down to one thing, how do we make those things happen? The answer is usually money. <laughs> how do we get that? The answer is revenue and grants. That's why my answer for this question is that we need a county grant writer position. The fact is that a grant writing position would literally pay for itself. You can put stipulations on the job so that they are either paid out of commission for each successful grant or you can put a stipulation on a salary that they must bring in as a certain amount for county income each year that would add up to their salary amount or more in order to ensure productivity within the position that would pay for itself. There is so much money <laughs> that we miss out on due to the fact that we do not have anyone actively searching for and writing grants for our county. The county grant writer could aid in grants for our nonprofits as well, which would mean that the county would pay less out of pocket in nonprofit donations based on the money that they push into nonprofits through grants. A grant writer would be an amazing start so that we can up our game on in the tourism department, which would create revenue for our hotel through our hotel motel taxes and our sales taxes. This would help support other priorities which would be also partially covered with grant money, such as sewer, water, other things that the people are going to bring up tonight. Literally, we can cover all of this. <laughs> grant writers are important. The big thing is that we cannot prioritize one need at a time. This county should be prioritizing multiple tasks at once and working on them simultaneously as resources become available. Infrastructure like water and sewer, family assistance, sidewalks, animal control, tourism, high quality jobs, etc. It all ties in together and needs to be addressed simultaneously as opportunity presents itself. And more opportunities will happen if we have a strong grant writer in a county grant writing position. Most pressing issues in the county. It's hard for me to prioritize those because I haven't spoken to every member of this county yet. I intend to, if I can. And if I get elected, I'll make sure it's outside of my district as well. I can tell you, as Mr. Booth has reiterated and Ms. Melissa Fields reiterated last week, Indian Mound is in dire need of water, whether it's by well or by pipeline. There are people out there that don't want a pipeline. They don't want to be forced to hook into a public utility. And I understand that. I don't want to be beholden to any man either. I also understand that there are many out there that do have wells and have been fighting dirty sulfur wells for decades and had not had any progress. And it just by happen chance that my mother-in-law's uh, natural spring that they lived off for over 30 years ran dry and regrouted. Not any fault to her own. It's not any fault to the well companies that they can't get out to them because they're so behind with the progress and growth of the surrounding areas either. Can't blame them when she's the only well down in that holler that has an issue. I understand a rolling waiting list is required for a business decision. That doesn't mean, like Mr. Booth said, that in the 21st century we shouldn't be able to figure out a way to get water. Whether we buy more water wholesale off of Woodmont, whether we buy our own county well drilling device or contract out an external well digging contract to come in for two years to get us caught up or help the current well companies expand, whatever they need to expand. I'm not sure how we're going to get it done, but it needs to get done. That is, I don't care, food and water, those are necessities. 
You can talk retail, you can talk recreation, you can talk all those things. While we have citizens in this county fighting for food and water, nothing else matters. What do you think are the most pressing issues in the county that need to be dealt with? You got three minutes. Okay. Um, I'm going to address two. I'll, I'll, animal control first. Uh, I've been on the animal control meeting, committee for four years. Uh, the big problem with animal control in this county, there is a definite need for an animal control shelter in this county. The problem is we've got a lot of people that are really concerned about animals that come to these meetings, but they cannot get along with each other. They have a, a main one issue that they will not agree to. And for four years, we've tried to work with them to get them to get along with it. They can't. Some way, somehow, we need to get those people to work together. We can we can get an animal shelter here in this county, but we need those people to work together. Those people are not on the county commission. They're they're just normal people who love animals. But they will they will speak to one another. Part of them is a kill, parts no kill. That's their main problem, and they will not get together. Uh, the other issue is the water. Uh, I'm a, I'm a lucky one. I have city water. All they want shepherd water. We have city water running down the road. The North Stewart Water Company is it's not a county funded group. It's a, it's a private private group. So the county commission really has nothing to do with that at this time. I mean, we're not like Dover does their water, and there's a where uh, Leatherwood has theirs. West, West, yeah, West Stewart. Yeah, they have theirs. The county commission does not handle the water problems. Uh, I don't know what the solution there is. I know people in the Indian Mountain area have been wanting for years for them to, to run new water lines up there. I don't know the ins and outs of the North Stewart Water District. I've never been to one of those meetings, so I don't know what their financial situation is. If there's anything that we could do, I'm for it, because I know what it's like not to have water, but luckily I do now. But at this time, you know, they control their own business. I think, you know, maybe you, me, could start attending those meetings, you know, the North Street Utility District and, and get involved there. That, that might help. Uh, there's a lot of issues in the county. Those are just two that came to my mind. The budget this year was hard. Uh, after everybody made their request and we looked at the tax money coming in, we put a million, a million three hundred thousand in the hole for this year. So we had to get that number down. Hopefully next year, better. A lot of this year, people have asked me what happened this year. A lot of this year's budget was due to the fuel prices. Where I work, the county highway department, about all we learned to fix They had to put in requests for a lot more money. The sheriff's office had to do the same thing. And so did the school system. Thank you. Right, go ahead and stay up there. And give you the, next the next question is, what state or county resources do you intend to use in order to ensure you understand what is expected of your job as a county commissioner? If you're an incumbent, what have you been using? You got one minute. Okay. Uh, when I first got elected, we anybody who was elected in 2018 or after has to attend uh, CTAS. Or we, we went to Murfreesboro and went to like a two-day presentation. The do is we don't be an county commissioner. We we got literature. Uh, there's there's a website we can go to. I've looked at that several times. So. If I ever have a question about anything, I can call the CTAS, I can go to the mayor's office. There, there's resources we can use for anything we can. Thank you. Hey. This is Mr. Bruce uh, State. You know, different CTAS, you know, there's different you know, courses, different websites, stuff like that. I'm going to lean a lot on my mayor. Other commissioners, and I've had several commissioners tell me from every district, if elected, don't hesitate to ask a question. It's like I stated when I question one or two. I'm not going to know everything. Never going to plan it. But I'm going to use every branch possible to find an answer. And like right now, I, I don't know where they're going to be at. I'm not there yet. But I will depend a lot on my mayor and my other commissioners. 
that guide me in the right direction to be my best for everyone. The answer is all of them. <laughs> CTAS, TSA, county lawyer, other commissioners, county mayor, Tennessee comptroller. I don't really believe in relying on just one resource. I will make sure that I continue to familiarize myself with available resources throughout my time should I be elected. It's easy for me to get up here and say exactly what they said, okay? Uh, CTAS, uh, County Technical Assistance Service, is a great service put on by the uh, University of Tennessee. Um, your Tennessee Legislative, your General Assembly bodies, right? Your County Commissioners, your fellow man, your neighbors, all those are excellent resources. I'll never claim to say that I know everything about any one particular topic. I'll, I'm always ready to hear uh, multiple perspectives and multiple angles and to look outside of the box. Uh, the main thing, as far as resourcing that I plan to bring is collaboration between all entities. Our, our county should work hand in hand with our municipalities and each department within. Our county should work with our state and our federal agencies, not just our representatives, but also PWRA or TBA or anybody that has a hand in the control of this county. They should all be working together and should be open book to everybody in the county. Mr. Shepard, we're going to start with the last question. Are you allowed to discuss issues with the county mayor or other members prior to a meeting? Yeah, one minute. Prior to a meeting, this is a little tricky here because of the sunshine law. Um, like me and Jane, are not here. <coughs> me and Jane can sit here and talk about anything we want to, but if Robin walks up, we got to stop. Sunshine law. Before a meeting, uh, yeah, we can get together and talk about things, but not in groups of three or something like that. We can't, we have to be in a public setting before we can discuss things. Uh, I go to Robin's office quite often. I've been there several times in four years. Me and him can sit and talk about anything. But if another commissioner comes in, hey, it, it's off. That's just the way the law is written. So, yeah. Take that question, please. Are you allowed to discuss issues with the county mayor or other members prior to me, before me? All right. So, if it's anything, if it has to persuade a vote or to ask how someone's going to vote or anything like that, absolutely not. We'll never, ever, ever condone that. Now, let's say we have something going to vote and I don't understand. Let's say I don't have all the facts. For me to properly give a yes or no vote, I might ask that I don't understand the situation. But in no time in that will I ever say, well, how do you want to vote? Do you think yes or no? I would never, I, I don't agree with that. But. To, to successfully do a correct yes or no vote, you need to know all the information on hand. And I will, I, I feel, in, you know, no, never private, and I'll never talk private, but if I had a question, I would probably ask, but never persuade a vote. All right, I'm about to speed, speed read through this, guys. <laughs> According to Tennessee Comptroller of the Treasury and the Open Meetings Act, the Tennessee Open Meetings Act defines a meeting as the convening of governing body of a public body for which a quorum is required to make a decision or to deliberate towards a decision. A governing body is any public body consisting of two or more members with the authority to make decisions for a recommendation to a public body or on policy or administration. Meetings to make a recommendation to a single individual, such as a county mayor or dean of educational institution, are not meetings covered by the Open Meetings Act. On-site inspections, chance meetings, and informational workshops are also not considered meetings under the Act. So long as there is no discussion or deliberation towards a decision that must be voted on by quorum of the governing body, advisory meetings with attorney, attorneys regarding anticipated, anticipated or ongoing litigation are also exempt from Tennessee Open Meetings Act. But actual decision regarding litigation must be made at an open meeting. According to this, I can speak to the mayor whenever I'd like, 
so long as we do not deliberate towards a decision that must be voted on. I'm going to try to summarize that. Right. <laughs> uh, what Ms. Scarborough is talking about is the Tennessee Open Meetings Act. That is what's commonly referred to as the Sunshine Law. Um, it, my understanding of it, and of course, that is where I would go talking about resourcing. That's the resource I would use. It's the piece of legislation that states. Um, my understanding, though, is what that does is prevents a certain number of us getting together behind closed doors saying, hey, it's Friday night, let's get together. Having enough in a quorum, which is enough to hold a meeting, open that meeting up, set a motion forward, vote on that motion, close the meeting, and then go in on Tuesday with property assessors and say, hey, we're raising taxes, right? That's what that act is to keep us from doing. It's also to keep you from lobbying with business entities, right? Or as she stated, like the dean of admissions or deans of the college, right? They have representatives, there are specific forms and specific lobbying laws that regulate how and when they're allowed to talk about particular issues. But I would use uh, Tennessee Open Meetings Act as my resource for that. Everybody's answered all the questions. Now everybody will have uh, one minute for closing. We'll start with Jan. Well, I want to thank all of you who have been out this evening. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them to me. I'll be more than happy to answer. And go go. Thank you.
the uh, questions for the audience. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Black? <laughs> Uh, 
I, I just want to say I'm willing to look into it. I, I'm not going to say I know much about it, but I can definitely look into it. And I honestly believe that if it is a huge issue, then there's no reason why, like you said, we can't at least just put up a stop sign that like beforehand or uh, I don't know, one of those warning flash signs or something. There's something that can be done and I'm willing to look into it and ask questions. Now, sir, uh, I can't really say much more than what they've said as far as there. And I know you've asked a specific question, and I'm sure you're hoping for a very specific answer. Uh, and I don't mean to speak in generalities, but that's really all I have to speak on. Um, viable ideas are getting our uh, Dover entities and our county sheriffs out there more often. I know I've seen, you know, a couple days ago, I saw about six of them from various different agencies all throughout Highway 79. I'll be able to have one posted up in dangerous areas like that occasionally, at least for a certain time to, like we said, slow them down until we as a commission can get together and figure out a good game plan to present the proper argument to the state and show them that, you know, it is a necessity and that it's a public safety concern. And then I'm sure the state would help uh, fix that issue. I know you're talking about the Lick Creek exit onto Spring Street, correct? Out of the park area, right where it comes onto Spring Street. Yes, sir. So uh, on that area, I know that I venture down into Lick Creek quite a bit because of the boat ramps in Indian Mound are hardly accessible. And so I use Lick Creek and Dyer's Creek quite often. I have a large boat and I would definitely appreciate the intersection being made safer. Uh, there's many intersections throughout our county I'd appreciate to be made safer. Um, that's something I would ask and call on every citizen to slow down and pay attention to where you're going and then drive forward from there. Well, it seems to me that, uh, you know, like the city waits on the county, the county waits on the state, the state don't know the problem exists or even where we are. Yeah, right. And that takes the, the proper person and the one proper commission to bring all those entities together to get a solution for you and every one of the citizens out there. Other questions? Are we still, was this for everyone or just for Mr. Black right now? Which one, where are we at? This is for Mr. Black or for him? I'm going to go with her first. We'll get back to you in a second. This is not a hypothetical question. This really didn't happen. And I guarantee to new candidates, when you get in there, you're going to be dealing with this. So uh, you get pulled aside after meeting by a couple of commissioners, and they tell you not to vote on something, or you won't be reelected. How would you handle that situation? Is that for everybody? Yes. Whoever wants to answer first. Um, so your question is, if someone asked you to vote a certain way, or you wouldn't get elected? All right. They tell, no, they tell you, you you don't vote for something, or you won't be reelected. Am I asked that by uh, by a uh, voter or by, by a couple of commissioners? I work for the people that vote me in, not for that commissioner. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? I'm not sure what you're asking. A couple of commissioners pull you to the side tell you not to vote for something or you will not be reelected. How do you handle that situation? I'll vote how I want to vote. I mean, I'm not going to listen to other commissioners. If, if I feel strongly about something, I'm not going to listen to another commissioner and I've got someone in the public or a lot of people in the public. Yeah, I'll listen to them, but you know, us 14 commissioners, we, we have to make our own decisions. So I'm not going to let two just be strong on it. I think that personally, if somebody comes to you and says that, then they don't have the people's best interest in mind. And I think that if it's a matter where you don't believe you're going to be reelected for voting something, then maybe either you need to educate your constituents more before making that vote, or maybe it's one of those things where, you know, maybe you're not making the best decision for your people, but ultimately you need to go with the majority of the people that voted you in. And if you're doing that, then you're going to get reelected anyways. It doesn't matter. And what somebody comes up to you and says to you, they don't get to control whether you get reelected or not. You have to do what's best for the county. Uh, 
again, in, in different words, I'm beholden to no man, no woman, other than my wife and my God, and if elected, then to the constituents within this county. Uh, no position of power or authority is going to sway my opinions. I personally don't think that any commissioner should let any other commissioners intimidate them into voting one way or the other. You vote your conscience and what is in the best interest of your constituents. Right. Question for all four, all five of the commissioners. Okay. As one of uh, 14 potential commissioners, I asked this last week, your first duty will be to elect a chairman of the commission. You 14 commissioners are the legislative body of Stewart County. You set the agenda, you set the county's business. Because the mayor is duly elected by the people of Stewart County and works every day in the offices of accounts and budgets, with the county finance director, the assistant to the finance director, human resources, the executive staff secretary, and every other aspect of county government. Traditionally, the county commission elects the county mayor as the chair of the full commission. Still, do you understand the distinction between the two, the different responsibilities of the two, and which one you, as commissioners, actually have control of. And that's for all of you. We'll start with Mr. Mr. Ralston. Uh, to address that question, Mayor Brandon, um, <clears throat> first answer is going to be more than likely I'm going to have to lean on some people to figure out the exact difference between those positions of authority and what uh, their uh, you know responsibilities entail and what power that has. Um, and if traditionally within the county the mayor has held that, then you know that may be the, the right choice for the chair of the board. Though the mayor is duly elected as the executive mayor of the county, that does not mean that he is duly elected as the chair of the commission. That falls on the commission who is duly elected by their constituents between each district. In the event that that arises and I'm elected, I'll have to sway that decision at that time. Um, uh, that's, that's much. I agree with what he said. <laughs> it's a matter of who shows up, who does the job, who is able to guide the commission properly. Because if that's not the mayor, then that's not the mayor. If it is the mayor, then it is the mayor. But I want to know that whoever is stepping in and doing that job is going to do the job correctly. That's it. So. When we get there to that day, I guess that's in August, the first meeting, that's when you elect, October, October that's when you elect the chair and everything, right? Well, I know normally it is the mayor. It's also going to depend who's the mayor. It's going to depend who's the best one fit for that position. Am I going to vote on him just because he's the mayor? No. I'm going to vote on him as a person. I'm going to vote on him as is education to lead that position. And um, like I said, there's, four, there's 14 of us. It all depends who's nominated. I mean, the mayor and I ain't get nominated. Who knows? Until that day comes, we have no clue. But I will use, I will, my vote would be who's best for that position. If it so comes the mayor, and at that time, and he's the best fit, then yes. Uh, four years ago, when I first got elected, uh, we elected Rodney. Uh, like he said, that is tradition, it's not law or anything. That's something we can look at every year. Uh, Rodney's chairman of the commission right now. And if I'm reelected, you know, we'll have to look at, when it, that time comes, we'll have to look at the job Robin has done. If I think he's done a good job, I'll vote for him for the chairman again. If I think he hasn't, We'll look at someone else, but it just, it's just—it's a year-to-year thing, and just it's on, it's on the job training, as you said. The chairman of the commission is a figurehead. The only authority they have is in a tie-breaking vote. Otherwise, they are required to run the, the 
meetings in accordance with Robert's Rules of Order. So no matter who is the chair, whether it's the mayor or another commissioner, they have the same requirements. The meeting has to be run by Robert's Rules of Order. They have no authority to speak during the meeting other than to <coughs> conduct the meeting in accordance with Robert's Rules of Order. So no matter who the chair is, it makes no difference whether it's the mayor, whether it's another commissioner, they are merely the person who runs the meeting. They do not have any authority at the meeting. They have no authority even to speak unless the commission gives them the authority to speak during that commission. So again, it would be who is the best qualified candidate to run the meeting in accordance with Robert's rules of order. Mr. Black, would you agree that the chair of the commission sets the agenda? Only because they set the agenda only because the commission permits them to set the agenda. I don't understand your question, your answer. Well, the, 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 the commission has input. If a couple of commissioners want to put something on the commission agenda, they can, but the county business is set by the commit the, the chair of the commission. Only it sets the agenda. The commissioners permit the chair to do it. That's true. That's, right. That's true. That's but said. but that doesn't mean that they have a hand in it. Is that correct? They do have input into it. In matter of fact, any any commissioner that wants something on the agenda is required to be put on the agenda <clears throat> by Robert's rules of order. Well, uh, well, you generally you like to have more than one commission to bring something. Can I go to the next question for Sydney, please? Does anybody else have other questions? Uh, Mayor, actually, I had an additional follow-up for Mr. Black on that, just some clarification, if, if I may. Uh, Mr. Black, uh, you mentioned the tie-breaking authority, right? The tie-breaking vote for the yeah. chair. Okay. Um, could you clarify, so say the chair of the commission is the mayor, who does not normally have a vote. So there would be 14 votes by all 14 commissioners, and then the executive position would have that tie-breaking vote making 15 votes right if the chair is elected is a commissioner elected does he no longer have votes in a regular vote does he always last two vote or if he's already voted and we're in a 14 14 tie does he just have the authority to make his decision based on the way that that that's a good went. question i don't know the answer to okay. all right thank you mr Rolson. i can tell you this um the, the county, the chair of the commission is the tie-breaking vote, but if the mayor is not elected the chair of the commission, the mayor, the mayor automatically has veto power over whatever the commission votes for. So you don't have, as a mayor, you don't have veto power over the commission unless you're not chair of the commission. If you are, if you are not chair of the commission, you have veto power. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Do we have any other questions? I have a repeat question from last week. Did you have anything to add in this Well, I was, what I would like to see, because, you know, we talked about the water, the problem with the water. You know, a big percentage of this county is on well water. I worry all the time about my well water because i got a junkyard next door. You know, I would like to see some kind of resolution in the county or something. Even just a committee. Some some counties have committees. They don't even have a resolution. Just a committee. I know we got a health and safety committee, but you know some of the people on it you cannot trust. I can say that, but there's certain commissioners that are not going to look into a problem. Something to protect people in the county from health and safety issues with these problem properties, because there's all kinds of them. Believe me, I've sent. I've been around taking pictures of all kinds of properties in the county that are horrible, and I've sent them to a news station, and they are just can't believe it, that this is being allowed in this county, you know. Um, that's why we've got a petition going statewide. We used to have one going countywide, but I think maybe I have a little better luck with the state instead of the county. But I would like to see something to protect people out here from these kind of properties, <clears throat> especially, you know, with so many people being on well water. Then now we don't, you know, 
industry that's going to come in here. You know it's coming, whether people want it or not. It's coming in here, and uh, we got a neighbor down the road. He don't have a clue yet, but he's going to get a 24-hour gas station right next to him. That's coming. I know this because I know the owner of the property, and he's going to be very upset when that happens. But there's nothing to prevent it from happening. You know, he's on the well water. I'm not sure. You know, it's going to be an issue for him. My neighbor spent three days in the hospital because of his well water. Don't know what the issue was there. But there needs to be something out here to protect people from health, safety, and welfare nuisance properties. If it's just a committee that goes around talking to people who have these properties and trying to resolve the issue, you know, talk to them, see what's going on. Can we clean this up? If somebody needs some help cleaning it up. I'm sure there's enough people in this county that will get together and work to clean it up. Yeah. Uh, so Ms. Van, uh, Van Zandt, correct? Rebecca yeah. Van Zandt. Um, uh, I've heard you speak at many of these forums and uh, I'm not 100% aware of your exact circumstance and I haven't been involved and I know you've spoken at many other forums and you've worked very hard and diligently, which I greatly appreciate. Uh, any citizen, if they have an issue, should work just as hard as you to try and figure out viable solutions. I would, uh, before I say I would support a resolution, I'm willing to look at uh, writing or drawing up resolutions that better our community. Public health and safety is a great avenue to approach that topic. Before I could make any decision on implementing a policy that may or may not restrict others in the community, I would have to see more data on the actual, um, you know, how many people's wells are, act are actually being um, diluted or um, polluted by their neighbors who have so many vehicles. Is that really the actual cause of your well or is that the natural, the area that your well is in? Uh, you know, the sulfur areas in Indian Mound, the wells with all that sulfur water, I couldn't tell you where the sulfur is coming from. I imagine it's natural, but no telling. Maybe it's coming from somebody dumping sulfur somewhere. I don't know, right? Um, I'd have to have more data to be able to impose a resolution countywide on every member of this count, county and community if there's only a select few that are having that particular issue. Uh, but I absolutely would look into that and look into the data, but I would need more data and information. I think he makes a good point, and I think that that's where, you know, we do need to involve ourselves with more organizations, like, for instance, the IDB and everything, you know, we, we and also look into laws regarding, you know, what kind of pollution laws are there that are going to keep you safe as well without going into ordinance. Now, you've talked about, you know, a resolution that can be passed without zoning and ordinances. I would like to look more into that, um, you know, because I've heard you at these forums as well. Um, but you know, ultimately, we do have to go with what the voters decide. I would love to talk to more community members about this. Um, you know, I think that we don't really need to necessarily form a committee over it simply because we already have an IDB that's forming, and you know, they, you know, that's part of their job. So, uh, but my mind is completely open, and I'm willing to work to find an answer for you. As previously stated, as of right now, unless I'm elected, I am on IDB, which if elected, I have to step down from that position. If not elected, I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna continue to fight for the county. One of our things is we try to find businesses or industry that want to come to our community and invest in our community. We're looking at different properties and in fall and on, on this when you do look at property we got to look at what kind of impact it's going to bring on neighbors just like you said you had a you know where the gas 24-hour gas station go right next to a hat and i think i know what you're talking about and it is just dead on yeah, yeah I, I, i'm driving by the other day and i said wow because that person built a house in the woods to not be seen I guarantee he's very upset. I guarantee he's very upset because now there's not a single tree on that side of his house. Yeah. He don't even have a. He has a dirt driveway. He don't even have gravel. He, he don't want to be known he's back there. Now he's wide open. And if they're open 24 hours, there's going to be lights on. So, part of us on the IDB, we look at stuff like that. So there's already, you know, we're, we're not. We're still setting our bylaws and everything. We're not fully, completely running yet. 
But as we make these decisions on different industries and different businesses, we hold y'all citizens in our minds to every decision. We're looking at places where there might be two, three hundred acre field or pick a property and this can go to the middle of it. It don't have to be on the side of someone's house. And, you know, just like that fuel, that fuel station, the water's gotta go somewhere. They're gonna, when it rains, they're gonna have to have, and there's no, where's it gonna go? Kentucky Lake. Exactly, Kentucky <laughs> Lake. Or a creek. Because you got a water, you know, Stewart County has a big watershed. Mm -hmm. And then you got Barkley Lake, you got Kentucky Lake. Well, only a couple miles from the lake. So, most of your big businesses like that have to be, they got a retention pond where basically where all this water, yeah, it had to be looked at that there is no hazard stuff. And if it's just regular rainwater stuff like that, it has to go to a retention pond. And then it's, and in this pond, it's supposed to be big enough to hold all the water that water sheds off of business and it dissolves into the ground. That is for watershed. That's not for no chemicals or anything. Now, part of the IDB, if something come like that, we got to make sure they have the correct uh, permits and everything. Like, like, like you know, like a lot of your restaurants have grease traps. You know, they can't just release that out. So t companies come and pump these back out. So a lot of times, like that, you might have something that gets contained somewhere and it gets pumped out. You know, I think the closest hazardous landfill to Stewart County is um, Camden. It's a ha they have a hazardous, a lot of your stuff comes off Fort Campbell, goes to Camden. They're set up for stuff like that. So part of us at IDB, we're gonna stay on top of this, and hopefully in your situation, I've heard your situation several times, and I'm, you know, I'm not there yet, I can't make that decision, I can't make a vote, I can't do anything yet. If elected in that situation, I feel for you, I feel sorry for you, for something I could do, I would do it tomorrow, but I can't. But like I said, even if not elected IDB, I will fight for you, regardless. And I would love to talk to you farther if you ever needed to. Uh, I've addressed this issue several times, affecting residents. <coughs> As of right now, there's nothing we can do. And you've heard this before. Uh, there's no codes in this county, so there's nothing we can do. I know you've talked about a resolution. Uh, I've asked about a resolution. The person I talked to, that, that's just the beginning step of the code. So, as, as it stands right now, there's nothing we can do. Sorry. The County of Powers Act. If you take a look the at County of Powers Act, if you Powers Act. One of the major, two of the major issues in the growth and development plan for Stewart County is water and sewage. Yes. That's one of the biggest impediments to growth in this county. And drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the only thing. That's not the point of your growth. Okay. As we were doing our petition in this county, a lot of people have concerns. We was pushing a junkyard ordinance is what we were pushing on. Not junkyards, but junkyards. <laughs> we had some commissioners come to us and say that's a stepping stone for codes and zoning. I said, no, it's not. It's an ordinance that y'all have the power. The commission has the power to write that up any way they see fit to benefit this county. So that, that, that's what we're trying to put out there. So as we talk to other residents in all y'all's districts, 80% of the people we talked to wanted to sign our petition, but they was afraid to. Because they might, what, what some of the people was hearing, when we said junkyard ordinance, they was hearing junkie yard ordinance. That's not what we was pushing. But as we went out in the county, that was one of the main concerns of, of y'all's constituents. So now we, we, we feel obligated that we need to put this information out there because there's a lot of misinformation being fed to current commissioners and residents of this county. And we need to get that cleared up because this county's at a crossroad right now. We're going to have to make a decision. You want to have poor planning or good planning? 
but you need to protect also the people's property values because this county depends on the revenue, tax revenue. So I'm getting kind of worked up because here's what happens. Here's what I've done. I've spent thousands of dollars planting evergreen shrubbery to try to block what we consider a junkyard. In the eyes of the state of Tennessee, 10 or more inoperable vehicles is considered as a junkyard. In the eyes of Tennessee, that's within sight of the state highway. I got a 50 foot gap right now that I haven't been able to fill in with shrubbery. We've talked to this landowner because he doesn't live there. He lives in the county or in the city where there is codes. So he can come out there and dump anything he wants. Not refrigerators or tires, that's where the state steps in. But that 50 foot section, here recently, he's backed a junk vehicle within eight foot of my property line. Knowing that that makes us upset, I got a, over a hundred foot strip of evergreens that he could push that vehicle back there out of my sight. So when I step out in my backyard, the first thing I see is a piece of shit. I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, I get upset. But I shouldn't have to look at that. Any other resident shouldn't have to look at that. But that's all we're asking is to keep a commissioner, to keep an open mind. And just don't wait for phone calls. Because you have certain circles that are close to certain commissioners that they're only going to take those phone calls. You need to do like me and my wife did. We went out and done a petition. Get out there on those people's front porch. Because you got people who's pulled away from this county. If you don't believe it, did you go to Eagle Fest? The, the boom slang? There's a few that turned out, but not many, because a lot of people are pulled back away from this county. They, they just disconnected from this county because they gave up. That's all, all right. I have to say about it. Yeah, we're going to have to go on. We're going to have to move on. I appreciate all that, though. That's good info. All right. Hey, that. I know you're wanting to ask the female commissioner questions. Well, I should your be question? able to ask Mr. Black at least one question. I mean, he hasn't had an answer. I don't want to argue. Argument. Okay, here's the deal. How about you let somebody else ask the question? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Let someone else ask the question? Okay. Yes, yeah, so let somebody else ask the question. Just read that. Just read that. This whole thing? Yeah, just read that. Who knows? Mr. Black, this is um, Now, wait a minute. Is this, is this related to policy? Yes, related it's related to fraud. Let me just read it, Mr. Black. It's related to fraud, waste, and abuse. I mean, we've asked the question for eight, for four years now. As a commissioner, Mr. Black, as a commissioner for the last eight years, you filed many complaints against Stewart County with multiple state offices. You've probably cost the staff and our accounts and budgets fifty thousand dollars in lost man hours. Have any of these complaints yielded any results? where you've been proven right, and what are they? Absolutely. Well, what are they? We haven't seen any of them. How about the $100,000 was transferred from the school system to the sheriff's department? There's so, been no finding from the state. Okay. But, Pardon me. Am I, I mean, speaking or you? Okay. You have, to, you have to tell us about facts. The facts. I found a complaint with the comptroller's office, which is what I'm required to do because any known instance of violation or abuse, I have a duty, a statutory duty, to file a complaint. I filed a complaint. That complaint went to the comptroller's office. There were congressmen and senators in this state that were trying to pass legislation to correct that and make it legal to do that. They couldn't pass it. They did not pass that session. The comptroller called me back and said, Mr. Black, we regret to tell you that we're going to do nothing about this because too many counties in this state are doing the very same thing. Even though there are two Supreme Court cases and numerous district cases that have said that it is illegal to transfer funds from the school system to the Sheriff's Department. And this is related to the SROs? Yes. Okay. All right. Nothing was found? No, no it was found. It was it's found. illegal. But they wouldn't do anything because too many counties were violating the law. And it's uh, not the law. Yes, go ahead. I'm not 100% clear on all these facts. 
I do well remember that the, the issue was the, the school system was trying to pay for the SROs. The SROs are employed by the sheriff's <coughs> office to work at the schools. It was a simple transfer trying to pay the SROs. I don't think it was a big <coughs> Nobody was trying to steal money. It, it wasn't clarified correctly. And I will say this. If you don't know this, talk to people in other counties. Our state comptroller does not have that great of a reputation for doing anything unless they actually catch you with your hand in the pit. There's a lot of, I don't know other people in other counties, and a lot of them say, yeah, we can't get a We told the comptroller. They turn a blind eye. That happens. Mm -hmm. Great all you want. I'm telling you that happens. All right, that's the, you have a question? No, I'm just trying to keep okay. this on a All right, ball. so that's the end of the questions. Now, we do have a school board candidate here tonight. Uh, first off, let's give our candidates a big hand. I appreciate all of you participating. We're going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to bring our school board candidate out. <clears throat> These are our only school board candidates, so we'll, we'll get through this fairly quick, but you still get a two minute intro, answer seven questions, and then one minute closer. Seven or six. Oh, you're looking at yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Yep. All right. Yep. All right, go ahead. All right, uh, first off, I want to apologize for uh, to Mr. Vance for being late, for y'all for being late. I uh, had a work commitment that came up last minute. But I do appreciate uh, y'all having me tonight. Uh, my name is Jonathan Crocker. I've lived in Indian Mountains for 32 years, 32 years old. So all my life I've lived in Indian Mountains. I graduated from Stewart County High School in 2008. Uh, went to EMT school after that, studied at Austin P, studied biology at uh, Austin P. Uh, got three kids in three different schools, as I usually say on my Facebook. Uh, I got my son Jackson, he goes to the Stewart County Middle School. I've got my daughter Alice, she goes to Dove Elementary, and I've got my son Eli, who goes to North Stewart Elementary. Uh, my wife, I'm married my wife, Nikki, we married 10 years this year. Uh, she's a registered nurse up at Jenny Stewart as an ICU nurse, uh, so I'm very proud of her. So if anybody knows me, I know my family's my. My core value, my you know, my life revolves around my family. So I'm a family guy, I'm a native Indian Mound resident. My whole family's from Indian Mound. Uh, my uncle Hugh does the mud ball races in Indian Mound, so we're d deeply tied to the district. My family is. Why do you want to be a school board, school board member, and why do you think you would be good? Uh, okay, so. While I chose school board initially, I wanted to run for county commission. That was my goal a couple of years ago. I wanted to be county commission. But as my kids got older and I started doing more stuff, you know, getting involved in school activities with them and school sports and stuff like that, my focus kind of shifted on them and being invested into their future. And with that, invested with all the students' future. Um, I'm very, very, very uh, dead set on opening up the I call it a lack of trust in the school board and the school system that's developed over the last few years. Uh, most recently, you see on Facebook, there's a lot of you know animosity towards the school board versus parents and stuff like that. Also, I've got teachers reaching out to me uh, saying that they're not getting the support that they feel like need and they're afraid to come forward without being ousted by the, uh, by the administration. Um, another reason, though, is that we're, in the, we're well into the 21st century, and with our, the change in times that we've seen in our country, it's starting to trickle into the state and at the local levels. And these new problems require, in my opinion, a fresh set of eyes. So that's why I'm running for school board. I'm invested with my kids and with every student and staff member. I'm dedicated to holding the uh, administration accountable. And I'm uh, I, almost like an open door policy. If, like, all the, the back door kind of meetings that you hear of, I want to open those up. We're not going to do those. And I'm also wanting to bring a fresh set of eyes to a possibly new set of problems that the local, the local school system will face. What is your biggest concern with the school system in our county? Uh, lack of accountability. You see a lot of, uh, you hear a lot of, uh, we do have, let me preface this with, we have a lot of fine educators and administration in the county. We have some of the best workers that our children will ever need. However, I do feel like there's a lack of accountability and there's a lack of transparency that goes on. 
My biggest thing, my biggest concern is these internal investigations that you hear of here recently that never really get brought to the public light. I'm not for sure why they don't get brought to the public light, but it needs to be brought to the public light. Uh, I'm dedicated to doing that. I'm dedicated to holding our administration accountable if they're doing an invest internal investigation. I want to know answers. I want to build trust back between, and this is going to lead to question seven here in a few minutes. Uh, I want to build that trust between the voters, the taxpaying citizens, and the school board. Uh, we're, we're a public school system, and as most, I'm sure most of our commissioners and voters know that the, the school system gets the bulk of their funding from taxpaying citizens. So whether uh, whether you like taxes or not, we're fitting the if you're a taxpaying citizen, we're fitting the bill. So uh, that is my goal if elected. And the next question is kind of similar. But yep. Will you hold the school administration accountable to uphold applicable state law? Short, sweet to the point. Yes. Do you support or oppose the principles of CRT, which is critical race theory, being taught to our children? Critical race theory is something that's popped up here recently. I'm not really even sure where it came from. Uh, I can tell you my opinions on it all day, all night long. But let me just tell you what we need to do. We need to teach history. We need to do two things. Our teachers need to teach history. America is the greatest nation in the world. However, we have a dark history when it comes to some of our past. Yes, we did bring African Americans over here, and we used them for slave labor. We also, though, did that. We also treated Native Americans there, the Trail of Tears, for instance. We also have to teach history about six million Jews being uh, uh, murdered by the Nazis during World War II. So we need to teach history. Now that is, that's bone dry. We don't need a leftist agenda. We don't need a right wing agenda. We need history, black and white, to the point. So yes, we need to teach. Uh, slavery and the, and, uh, the uh, civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s, but as far as critical race theory, we don't, I don't think we need to teach that. That's no business in schools, to, in my opinion. Also, the second part of that question is as a parent, and parent, this is, if you see on my campaign thing, uh, it's holding everybody accountable, parents, teachers, administration. Parents need to be held accountable to teach their kids and the students respect for their fellow man. I'm a God-fearing Christian. I believe we're all created equal in God's in God's image. So, we, my I teach my kids not to uh, not to see color or race or religion or you know gender for that matter. So, teachers need to teach history and leave it at history. Parents need to teach respect for their fellow man and woman. Do you support or oppose the LGBT agenda being pushed on our students? Why or why not? You have two minutes thirty seconds. The LGBT agenda has no business being taught to our students or pushed on our students in this county or anywhere for that matter. I cannot believe we're even having this discussion. And that's not saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this. That's not saying I'm against LGBT. That's saying that we don't need to, this has no room in education. It doesn't. We need to teach the core values. So for our elementary school, for instance, for, for, for first example, we need to teach math, science, social studies, English, spelling. That's what matters. We get into middle school and high school, we need to reinforce those things. However, we need to teach life science classes, how to do taxes, how to do a W-2. I didn't know how to do a W-2 when I came out of high school. Uh, how to do uh, you know, your uh, technical college skills and stuff like welding, uh, plumbing, electric, electric. There's no room in there for an LGBT agenda. However, again, I'm going to Go back to what I said a minute ago. We, if there are people that are different or have different beliefs than us, that, that's wrong to say different. If there's people with different beliefs than us or different ways of it, we still need to treat them with respect. However, our administration, our administrator and our teachers have no business teaching or pushing a LGBT agenda onto our students, especially, especially our elementary and middle school. The Biden administration intends to coerce, coerce schools to accommodate transgenders using whatever bathroom they want or risk losing federal funds. Do you support or oppose our district complying with this policy? Why or why not? You have two minutes, 30 seconds. It's going to be short, sweet, and point, Mr. Vance. I'm, uh, I'm a dad of a daughter. She's, uh, she's about to be in fifth grade, and I'm a dad of two uh, boys. So uh, I see both sides of it. I also study biology at Austin P. I studied uh, anatomy and physiology in both EMT school and and my biology curriculum. If you have a male sex organ, go to the boys for a men's restroom. If you have a female sex organ, go to
over the female and the girl's bathroom. It's cut and dry. And now whether we lose our funding or not, that's a battle we can fight another time and another day, but I feel like the bulk of the people in this county would agree with me on that. Do you support making directors of schools an elected position? Well, this one minute question. Okay, uh, so I was, it was my knowledge, and if I'm wrong, somebody correct me, please, was my knowledge that it used to be an elected position, but the state came back and said that it's not an elected position, but the school board needs to appoint it. So if that's what we're stuck with, then it goes back to the beginning when I was talking about it. We got to build a, a better trust for our bridge, a better trusting between parents, students, faculty, and the school board. So if you trust us, if, if I'm elected and my district trusts me, then I should be able to vote and pick the school the uh, director. Now, if they don't, then that's that's where the uh, the school board uh, members need to get out and talk to their district, talk to their, their voters, because if they don't, then that needs to be brought up. If you don't have trust within your district, you probably don't need to be on the school board to begin with. So in my opinion, if it's gonna be left how it is, then school board members need to have the trust of their voters to be able to be entrusted to pick, to pick the right person for the job. Okay, all right, you got one minute for closing. Uh, Politics, it, I'm, I'm ready for this to be over. Sydney knows I'm ready for this election season to be over. Uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's very, it's been great going door to door, talking with people and interacting with people. It's been good coming to events like this and, and really getting to know the folks that are going to be casting for the, casting their votes for you. And this week and throughout August, I want to thank everybody for the support that I've had, the messages, the, the uh, Facebook messages, the text, the phone calls. All the support that we've gotten, I'm hoping and praying that you know I'll be elected. But if not, that doesn't mean I'm not going to stop fighting, and that doesn't mean that you know I still won't be involved. I'm personally invested now at this point to our students, and especially my kids, but to our students as well. Before I open it up for questions, just some information to pass on to everybody. Between now, I think July the 18th is the last day that you can go online on our state website, State Education Department website and give input on the social study standards. And go back to question six in reference to the Biden administration trying to let the ABC freaks in any bathroom they want in our school. Yes, I put it that way. Um, you've got until August or September to go on a website and make comments about that before they change the policy. This is one of those administrative things where they do actually take comments. So you need to go on there if you don't want this kind of stuff coming down. And, get on, and I don't have that website. I'll try to get it and try to get it posted somewhere. But I know our school deal is between now and the 18th of July, which is next week, as far as the social justice standards. Does, does anybody have any information on the school system? Okay, all right. Just wanted to pass that on. All right, so now any questions for John? I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, okay, so obviously you are the only person running against an incumbent for the school board positions. You know, you talked about how people have to have, um, you know, trust with the people that they, you know, with their school board representatives, people that they elect to represent them. However, we have an issue right now where there's nobody running against incumbents. So then at that point you take away the voter's choice because there's only one person running. So how do you plan to build off of that to create that, to bridge that gap to people and elected officials? Lead by example. So uh, I put my name on the ballot and I'm hoping that, you know, that'll eventually spark. You know, we don't all run at the same time. You know, all the school board candidates, you know, don't run at the same time. So, you know, maybe on this next, was it two years from now, there'll be another school board election. Maybe that'll just, you know, maybe that'll just be uh, an opportunity for somebody else to put, throw their hat in the ring. You know, um, it's also a good thing. You know, I, you know, I've talked to Mr. Gillum. Me and Mr. Gillum get along really well, to be honest with you. And uh, you know, it's always good to have a competition. Competition drive. I worked at Tenova Healthcare, only hospital in Clarksville, and I've always been an advocate that we need more hospitals in Clarksville because hospital competition increases productivity. So I'm hoping that more people will see me. It's not scary, you know. It's, even though it's politics, it's not scary, you know. Uh, put your name on the ballot, and you know, and. Uh, I'm hoping to lead by example, and if we're elected, then you know, you'll, 
I won't be a quiet board member. So hopefully that, you know, and if you get to record them and get more people access to these board meetings, I continue to hope to lead by example. And hopefully we will get at least, if not new, new board members, um, at least maybe open up some more ears, I guess, per se, and maybe actually listen to their, you know, their voters in their district, so. Anybody else? Do you mind if I ask another question? Sure, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I've talked to um, our mayor and the county government, and we're going to be working on setting up a system so that, like, the meetings can be recorded when I'm not there. And so, is there any way that you would support that happening with school board meetings so that I don't have, like, nobody has to show up to do it because you would be providing the transparency? I would love it. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. Okay. I mean, you know me, I did, uh, you know, I'm talking to you, Sydney. I took, uh, I was in the Dover Firefighter One class, and uh, I missed the bulk of the beginning of the school board meetings when I first threw my, threw my name in the ring, and I would have loved to have, uh, you know, seen them, uh, seen them, you know, on video. Luckily, my father-in-law, Danny, uh, you know, he's the newspaper editor, so I, I read about it, and I see what happened on Facebook, but it'd be awesome to see uh, an actual video of it, so. And plus that does, and plus I will say that real quick, Mr. Ann. Um, I will say that that would probably eliminate a lot of the he says, she said stuff to you. 100%. So. I got a question for you. You mentioned about, you talked about the uh, elected school director, and yet the state did pass that. But that doesn't mean we can't get the state to change it. So is that something that you would lobby our, our local state rep for, or our state senator to, to pass it? I would talk with the voters in my district, uh, well, you know, at, along other people, if the majority of the people would want that, then yeah, we support it. You know, that's, I'm a, I think that's the, I think that's become too a misconception that, you know, we make our votes based on our own beliefs, and that's not true. We technically are an extension of the communities that we serve, and we vote and we <clears throat> make decisions based on input and uh, opinion from our communities. So if the community is open for that, then I have no problem with that. You obviously would have to have, you know, a set set of standards, in my opinion, you know, um, on what that position, what you would have to have before you could run for that position to make sure that nobody like me would just run and run for the director position, you know. So um, as long as we could, you know, talk with our voters and stuff like that, then yeah, I would be opposed to it. So. Any other questions? All right, hey, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here.